Wait, I have to put my dancing shoes on. You do. Yes, you should do that. Absolutely. Okay. Here we go. Are you ready? We can dance. I'm ready to go. That was a great dance. Good morning, Timothy. Good morning, Maya. Once How are again, you doing? I am doing very well, thank you. I hope that you are too. You definitely look so by the dance. So we've, how's it been? We've been doing this for a year and two months now, Maya. In two months, yes. So thanks to you and uh, a lot you of- You drive um, a hard bargain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know that you're scared to say no. You're scared <laughs> to say, well, I don't want to do it. But I I'm appreciate busy today. Yeah. yeah, that never works, exactly. does it? Indeed, your bravery is outstanding. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> well, you. well, we're heading to um, we're heading to the elections, right? The upper house elections. There have been right. a lot of things going on, as always. But this time of the year and at this point of time, of course, there is so much which uh, we don't hear in uh, the press and a lot. Uh, well, which we hear about in the press as well. So I'm very much looking forward to this session this morning. And of course, I'm going to give you the floor, the dancing floor. It was Thank yours. You. Yes. Okay. So Thank you very start. much. Okay. Good morning, everybody. And welcome back to uh, Japanese politics one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we always talk about what's going on in Japanese politics that's important to you, that helps you um, understand what's going on now. <clears throat> and prepare for what's coming down the path. And we can see that uh, very easy in what happened two weeks ago with the Quad and the visit of uh, President Biden and the uh, brand new premier, uh, prime minister from Australia and Moti from India who came to Tokyo, spent three days here. <clears throat> a lot is tumbling out of that. It's been two weeks now. And you can see a lot of things that are coming out as a consequence of that. Um, some things that are somewhat unexpected, but easily explainable. So for example, <clears throat> it's very important to the United States that Japan and South Korea have a, a better cohesion, a better relationship with each other. They've got a new uh, president there, President Yoon, who just took office uh, prior to um, uh, the Quad meeting. Uh, he had a little bit more time to prepare than the uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, who had one day to prepare. Um, but I think the, the Quad was viewed as very helpful and a, a step in the right direction. And you can see the countries um, building blocks being put together on building a, a better and a more cohesive, um, maybe unified defense against uh, China initially. Um, they tried to get some movement on Russia. They were unsuccessful there because of um, India's relationship with Russia. But I think they did um, many, many good things. One of the things that uh, you can see immediately is uh, the prime minister from Australia, um, although he, he doesn't have much foreign policy experience and not a whole lot was expected out of him, he's really uh, taken the bull by the horns. He's being much more active and much more aggressive with regard to uh, the country's stance to China. And also he's becoming a little bit more, even though it's, it's been a very short period of time, realistic about the, uh, the country's um, uh, new green deal to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, he understands a little bit better now what that entails. Um, and um, with regard to the United States, and South Korea and Japan and South Korea, <clears throat> You might have noticed that um, BTS, which is a hugely popular uh, South Korean uh, group, boys group, uh, they visited the, the White House. Uh, that's a very big deal. Um, and it was uh, organized and orchestrated as a consequence of this, this initiative to get you know, the countries working together and get um, Japan, South Korea, and the United States more, more cohesively aligned. So I think, you know, these things that you can see on the fringes 
indicate things that are going on at a much deeper level. You can't read too much into it, but um, it is it is somewhat significant. I think the um, uh, proposed uh, meeting of foreign ministers of South Korea and Japan probably next week, uh, proposed by Hayashi, uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi, um, will be one of those steps, one of those building blocks. There is a little bit of tension still between South Korea and Japan, as <clears throat> I guess we'll, we'll always expect, uh, just because of the history and the, the dynamics there. But uh, the fact that you know North Korea is just on the cusp of of having a nuclear test, so it's been quite a while since they've had an underground nuclear test. They've had maybe seventeen missile launches this year alone, a very high uh, incidence of tests. Um, and the issue was brought to the uh, UN uh, just last week. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, China and Russia vetoed any sanctions that were being proposed against North Korea on nuclear testing. So this, this um, division of you know, us against them, you know, China, Russia, North Korea, and what North Korea is, is doing in their aggressive stance, um, that line is becoming a little bit clearer. And you can see that in a lot of different areas. For example, uh, Japan um, accepting uh, the proposition that they need to expand their defense capabilities. They need to enhance their defense budget by from 1% to 2% of GDP. That's a huge, huge number. There was just a meeting uh, just this last week with um, uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kishida, and uh, the ambassador to, uh, from the United States, uh, Rahm Emanuel, a panel discussion that talked a lot about defense and the commitment of the United States to be there for Japan, but also to be working more collaboratively and to develop a lot of different things. That is um, a separate issue from what the prime minister is confronting with his economy. The economy is in uh, pretty pretty deep trouble. They just passed the two point seven trillion um, dollar stimulus budget. This is this is a huge deal, um, and he's he's com um, uh, kind of combined this stimulus budget with what he wants to do with his new capitalism. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that. And um, frequently uh, in the past, it's, you know, there, there haven't been any details and people have been critical of that. The details are starting to come out now. The prime minister is starting to talk a little bit more about it. He, there's been a couple of fights in uh, diet debates about, you know, the, uh, the, the legacy of Abenomics and what the new capitalism is going to be. And Mr. Abe, who is still very, very powerful, wields a tremendous power within the, the parliament, uh, didn't like some of the characterizations for the proposal that was being uh, put forward about how we're going to, you know, generate a, a more vibrant economy. So once again, Japan is um, stymied not because of external forces, but, but because of internal forces, what's going on in politics and who gets to decide what is being done, especially when it comes to, to money. Um, as Maya said, we've got the uh, upper house elections. Uh, the campaign starts on the 22nd of this month. So there's about a, a two week campaign period that starts on the 22nd and then campaigning begins and then it ends on the Saturday at uh, sundown. And then the vote uh, starts on Sunday the 10th. So the, the diet will close up next week and then it'll go into recess and then the campaigning starts. So there's a very, just a very little uh, gap there. Um, but the, I think this, this last, uh, diet session has been very productive. They passed the economic security legislation, which is a big deal. It's probably bigger and more impactful than what Mr. Suga did when he passed the uh, digital agency creation. Um, that, that was a pretty big deal. It, it received a lot of attention. It's going through some growth pains now, but they're still moving forward with the dream of having um, a digitized uh, government, which leads in in uh, effect after that to have a more digitized uh, economy. So first, let's focus on what we can control mo more readily. That's the um, various ministries, how they exchange information, how they store information, how they encrypt and communicate with each other, and then have that filter out to the economy. Uh, that's more of a five, 10 year plan, <clears throat> but it is uh, very well on the road. And there's been a couple of leadership um, changes there. Uh, the Japanese economy is 
you know, you, you will find out more about this after uh, the elections, I predict. Um, things are being kept pretty quiet now so that people vote for the LDP. That's one of the reasons for the stimulus package. That's one of the reasons why Cometo was pushing the LDP, form the stimulus package before the elections, not after. You remember there was a fight there. Uh, the LDP wanted to have the stimulus package after the election so that they could focus their intention on winning the election. Cometo fought that and said, do it now so that we can tell people, we can show people what it is that we're doing on their behalf. We're not just lazy. We're not just focusing on the election for our own selfish benefits. They won that. And I think they probably got some concessions out of that as a consequence. One of the concessions was this, um, this kinder, gentler LDP or the LDP Cometo in uh, distributing funds to, um, you know, single parent families uh, to, um, you know, distressed uh, families and, and children and to, to try and jigger up the economy so that people say the LDP is on our side. They're trying to do what we need them to do and also some, you know, cash handouts. So that's, that's predicted to, you know, bolster their image. And there are a lot of other things that are going on that they're specifically working on. <clears throat> We've had this discussion before about, you know, understanding Japanese politics and understanding it's like understanding the Japanese economy and how Japanese society works. If you don't know much about the gang or the Yakuza or how the underground economy works, you really don't understand the whole, the whole complexion of the Japanese economy because that, that underground economy comprises about 9% of what actually is going on. Similarly, in understanding Japanese politics, you really need to understand the role of scandal in the dynamic of Japanese politics. And as I predicted two weeks ago, and I mentioned just a little bit last week, it hadn't come up yet, but now we're seeing the emergence of a scandal. And I wanna talk about that because it's an interesting dynamic and it has the, um, all the markings of a kind of a campaign to uh, diminish uh, one party or one group of individuals so that some others can um, be hoisted as, as a consequence of that. Uh, you saw the same thing in the United States with the uh, the Russia collusion and, and with uh, President Trump, that sort of thing. It's the same kind of tactic. And here's the deal. So um, you might remember that the largest faction in Japanese uh, politics and within the LDP was the Hosoda faction. And um, after the election, Mr. Hosoda graduated. He was elevated. He became Speaker of the House. That left that position open. And Mr. Abe... Um, assumed the, the role as the leader of that faction. <clears throat> so um, Mr. Hosoda has been uh, criticized and complained through Bunshun. You know, Bunshun is one of those, those magazines that, um, yeah, it's, it's colorful. Uh, the credibility is a little bit uh, questionable at times, but given the dynamics of Japanese uh, press and media and the controlled uh, state of it, not all of the news comes out in Bunshun uh, provides that service. Uh, sometimes they do it in a kind of um, a way that almost resembles extortion. But they did sniff up this story about Mr. Hosoda, the Speaker of the House, and his proclivity to ask, um, you know, newspaper reporters, female newspaper reporters, and uh, younger members of parliament, females, to come visit him in his quarters to have talks and drinks and stuff like that. Part of that is not unusual because that's what Japanese politicians do all the time. I mean, if, if you've got any sort of throw weight, people want to talk to you and it's almost always after hours. I worked on a, uh, for a member of, of the parliament and uh, frequently after you finish your rounds, after you do your dinner, you maybe go to a speech or you, you give a speech, you're home at around nine o'clock or, or 10 o'clock, people are waiting for you and they wanna come in and just you know have a, a drink with you, smoke cigarettes and, and chat. And you get a lot of information there and you talk about a lot of different things. So that part is not unusual, but there does seem to be a little bit of a proclivity. And the reason why it's a little bit of a proclivity, but it's kind of blown into something that's a much more serious and, and a lot larger now is that um, Boonshun has written an article about that three weeks ago and they followed it up with a second article. Typically when Boonshun does that, they have their first article. Sometimes they call the person who's, article it mentions in a derogatory way and they give them a chance to respond or to 
um, negotiate the terms of how it's going to be released or maybe even uh, withholding the release of that. Um, I guess they did that with Mr. Hosoda because he's very powerful. He's, you know, a speaker of, of the House, <clears throat> a very long uh, career in Japanese politics. So it did have the, the feel of a hit piece. I don't think he was given that opportunity. They came in for a second piece and then uh, Bunchen is always uh, released on Thursday. Um, they came up uh, on Thursday with a third hit piece. So this is uh, really serious. It's serious for the speaker and it is serious for, you know, not only politics in general, but you know, the LDP and more specifically the Abe faction. So it's, you know, with the, the role of women in, in Japanese politics now and, and, you know, the Japanese push to have, um, you know, a certain number of females on the board of listed companies, you've, you've read about that push too. There's a tremendous um, focus on how um, women are treated and how just how politics is done. This never really was too big of a story in the past, number one, because people didn't complain about it people were afraid to complain about it, but also even if they complained about it, and you've seen this in the past before too, with the Me Too um, um, initiative that, that came to Japan, it didn't do so terribly well because people just don't report, they just you know back away from it. And the person who is the victim in this country, uh, particularly just continues to be the victim over and over again. Um, but this story is not going to die. And there is uh, the movement for a non-confidence motion that has been suggested since this third uh, Bunshin article. So um, I don't uh, know the veracity of the, the claims, um, but uh, sometimes these things don't need to be true. They just need to be um, uh, you know, promoted and, and um, people reach their own conclusions. People are um, you know, very quickly convinced and, and influenced by mass media here, you know, billboards, television, and the print media, they have a, a, a very special and, and a direct impact on how people feel and what they think about. So that alone was um, uh, pretty bad and you're gonna see this develop out now. It, he could survive as the uh, Speaker of the House for another week or so before we go into elections. And then after the elections, there will definitely be a, um, a cabinet reshuffle. There'll be new faces that come in and um, I think pretty, pretty clearly the, um, they will have a, a new Speaker of the House. What's going on as a, uh, in, in addition to that, but separate from that, is um, uh, another member of the Diet, formerly the, uh, well, he's, he's currently now the uh, Associate Secretary General for the Abe faction, uh, a fellow by the name of Nishimura. He's been in the Diet for uh, six terms. Uh, he has had two uh, cabinet portfolios, and um, he's been criticized for having on his his blog a picture of him as he traveled around the world uh, representing Japan in his various duties by having pictures of, of beautiful women in all the countries that he visited, and he collected those and published those on his blog, and he called it uh, the beautiful women of uh, Japanese diplomacy or something along those lines. And um, this was raised, uh, he took it down, uh, but people began to circulate his pamphlet of, of these shots. It's not a pamphlet that he put into paper, but it's just a pamphlet that he, he had on his webpage that was preserved and that's being circulated. So now he's being attacked too. He's also with the Abe faction. Abe, the Abe faction is the largest by far of all of the uh, six uh, Japanese fact, uh, political factions within the LDP. So you can see that as we get closer and closer to the, um, the election, things like this come up. Sometimes uh, they don't even need to be true. It's just, it's just excitement. It's, um, it's controversy at a very uh, poignant time. And it has the deleterious effect of you know, really damaging uh, the people or the associations that are, that are mentioned there. So it is something to keep an eye on. Um, I don't want to overstate it. I've spent way too much time talking about it, but it is an interesting facet of, of Japanese politics that you need to watch. Keep your eye open for things like this in the next, in the next two weeks. At the same time, we have to um, acknowledge that uh, the prime minister is doing extremely well, 61.5% approval rating of his cabinet. So I think the uh, approval rating of the prime minister himself comes out this week or next week. 
but these come on a on a monthly rotating basis and the evaluation the poll numbers for the cabinet uh, comes out very high and it's the highest that he has had since he took office and it's the highest for um, the prime minister in the last eight prime ministers at this particular point in their um, in their term so this tells you um, a couple of things it tells you one that some of his initiatives like new capitalism like the economic security legislation will have a little bit more um, power behind them a little bit more likelihood that they will be successful and that the time in the diet will be reduced as a consequence and we found that with in both of those instances but you'll also see that um, uh, his his um, aura as as the political leader is beginning to rise too you still got the, the factional thing so you know the the Abe faction with 98 uh, members of the parliament and the next closest one uh, uh, is uh, uh, about 58 individuals the next one after that is 57 and mr kishida's faction is even lower than that standing at around 30 37 or so <clears throat> so uh what's going to happen is the ldp is going to be building up for their election i think they're going to do extremely well in the election there'll be a cabinet reshuffle and then there might be some you know musical chairs happening with people who have been in one political faction changing it's not really um so such a great idea people always um think of people's credibility and their their loyalty and their devotion when they do that so maybe when they make that kind of a call they'll never be the head of the faction and maybe they'll get a, a cabinet portfolio but maybe not because there are other people that are more loyal but they are you know kind of leaving their factions and one of the factions that has suffered uh, uh most recently in that is the Aso faction who was Deputy Prime Minister and um, Minister of Finance. He is currently the Vice uh, Chair of the LDP. So that's something to look for um, as well. Let's see what else we've got going on. <clears throat> the Prime Minister has also put his hand up. He's, he's talked about it earlier, about joining NATO in Madrid just before the, um, uh, the election day in, uh, on July 10th. So um, at the end of this month, NATO will have their three-day uh, conclave. And for the first time in history, the Japanese prime minister will join that. In the past, the uh, foreign ministers have, have joined it, but this is a pretty big deal. Mr. Hayashi joined the ministerial meeting uh, two weeks ago for that in preparation and anticipation. And then the prime minister made a decision that that's what he's going to do. It's interesting when you Think about that and then the 2% number that the Japanese um, government is uh, considering to increase the Japanese defense budget, because that is the requirement for all NATO countries. People have asked me if NATO is going to be joined, uh, is if Japan is going to join or if NATO is going to accept uh, Japan as a, a NATO country. It doesn't make any um, real sense to me, but stranger things have happened, but it is important to note the 2%, you know, from 1% to 2%, that is pretty big. It's going to happen over, over a five-year period. And that was, you know, one of the underlying themes of the, the presentation with Mr. Kishida and uh, Ambassador Rahm Emanuel. So there's plenty to look at there and to be, um, to be anticipating. New capitalism, the details of that are becoming more and more clear. Um, one of the things that the prime minister has said, so he had his meeting, his special, um, uh, meeting of um, new capitalism uh, uh, leaders. Of course, he is the chairman of this committee. They had their third meeting uh, just this last week. Some more news is coming out of that. He is going to devote um, a, a lot of money to developing this. And, uh, you know, I guess because, you know, the way Japanese mass media works, a lot of the mass media is now reporting favorably about that. Yes, this is a good thing, and it's different from, uh, you know, Abenomics and the four arrows of of Abenomics, and you know, the Kishida is on the right track. So you're starting to hear more of that. Um, I don't know how they can come up with that analysis so early, but it is different from uh, what the policies as pursued by Mr. Abe. Um, but with this 2.7 trillion dollar stimulus package, you've got to understand, or you've got to to wonder, you know, how different is that? Because it's just an easy money policy. It is still an easy money policy. 
the Bank of Japan is elated that inflation is, you know, around 2%. That's what they've been shooting for. They understand that it's going to overshoot it, but their prediction is that it'll come back and balance out at around 2%, which is what their target was. <clears throat> um, the prime minister has identified uh, a certain budget that he's going to devote to 1 million Japanese workers. That's a, uh, it doesn't sound like a, a lot of people, but it is a, a large number of people, you know, uh, 125 million people throughout the entire archipelago. 10% um, of that uh, number actually live in uh, the Kanto Plain, Tokyo and surrounding Kanagawa and, and uh, Chiba. So uh, um, a million workers he's going to be focusing on to give them more training opportunities to help them, you know, skill up. I don't know why he's selected a, a million people, but they're, it's, it's a different group of people than you might initially think. So these are non-regular employees. They're people that have worked working in companies, maybe not on a say shining basis. Um, and uh, he wants to uh, build up the skill level. They've got a lot of, I think it's a, a, a trial, in fact, a trial um, period because they really need to have uh, plenty more uh, skilled people if they're going to be able to um, live up to the uh, proposals that they're making, not just with regard to increasing the, the defense budget. That means obviously, or maybe not so obviously, more people in the SDF, uh, more material, more, more security. Um, the creation of the digital agency, which also requires people. I mean, they they were so um, lacking of people with the technical skills that they didn't. They did rob some of the people from various ministries to help um, set up that agency in the first place. But they need many more people. So the currently uh, the agency is staffed with about five hundred people. They had to go out into um, you know the the uh, public corporations to entice people to come join, to be, um, you know, to leave behind, you know, the, the cushy jobs as, um, you know, corporate uh, warriors and to become bureaucrats. But I think they were successful in that. But that pool of people is, is somewhat limited, especially when you consider, you know, the foreign companies that are here, the, the large, um, you know, technical companies, Google, Microsoft, Apple, uh, the, the building of the um, uh, chip in the chip factory in uh, Kumamoto. Um, this just requires more people. And when the Japanese people, they, they've just uh, reported that once again, the, the birth rate has decreased again. And also the uh, number of deaths have increased uh, because people that are in that, that bubble of the um, uh, demographic uh, wave of the, um, I don't know what you'd call the grain society. So there are a lot of people there that the, the, the deaths are just naturally going to um, increase until that we've passed that bubble, but there, J Japan is in a is in a pretty pretty delicate situation. In of all the uh, G20 countries, Japan is at the forefront of this kind of phenomena of of lower uh, population, the economy beginning to shrink, um, and so how Japan deals with that. I mean, there are no. Um, real guidelines. There's no experience um, in, in dealing with that. Japan is kind of cutting the cloth on that. So everybody's watching it. Um, how, how it shakes out um, is anybody's guess. But the prime minister for his new capitalism is going to devote a lot. And this pro projects and kind of predicts um, what's going to be happening in the near term, probably in two or three years. He's going to be focusing uh, largely on quantum uh, technology. He's going to be focusing on AI and he's going to be focusing on biotechnology. So that's good news for people who are in those industries. AI is somewhat um, uh, young here in Japan. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are making money uh, implementing AI. But, you know, uh, South Korea is predicted to surpass Japan in terms of per capita GDP for the, the workers. Um, probably this by this time next year. So uh, Japan will be uh, in fourth place. And then it's, it's going to happen very rapidly with some of the other uh, smaller nations coming up in terms of productivity. So Japan, the, the best way to do that is increase the number of people. And if you can't do that, then you've got to increase the, uh, the technology. And it seems like that is the choice of the prime minister. So there's a lot to be seen there. Um, 
Uh, the other thing that he's um, uh, devoting uh, money to is uh, reducing uh, student loans. So that's a, a story that comes out of the United States. And Mr. Biden has suggested that he's going to cancel student loans, which is great for those people who gambled to go to college and um, kind of ate beans out of cans to do that. But it, it kind of angers those people who didn't take that gamble and uh, pick up a job rather than go to university. So there's a little bit of social tension there. The prime minister is going to pursue that and encourage more people to go to college and get higher education. The other thing that is, is coming out of uh, the new capitalism, but the budget isn't uh, part of that, but it's a 10, 10 trillion, I think 10 trillion yen um, fund for enhancing Japanese universities. So I, I know a lot of people in, in the audience have actually uh, gone to universities here. I went to Tohoku University uh, in the um, early 80s. And uh, going to a Japanese university is uh, significantly different from going to a, a foreign university anywhere in, in Canada, the United States, Australia, anywhere in Europe. It's just a different kind of mix and the facilities and the layout and the, the way they teach and the role of the professor and all of those things are, are very, very different. The prime minister is uh, committing to have these universities that take this fund, take advantage of this fund, to be on par with the top universities in the world. And I can also hear that that laughter coming through my earphones when when you when you hear that. But you know, Japan has um, done uh, significant things um, more remarkably in the past. I don't think it's a um, it's an impossible feat, but with the money uh, being spent and being used in the, the proper way, who knows what can happen, but this is the direction. I think the Japanese um, administration, the this administration, the Kishida administration, and if you think about what, what's happened over the last maybe eight months, um, there has been a, 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 a shift, a change in, in texture of how they are going to approach the economy. And I think that the robe will fall off and you'll see in all splendor what this means after the election. They don't want to talk about it too much now, but I think addressing what the problems are of the Japanese economy, uh, the weak yen, um, the, uh, the uh, supply chain um, angle, the, the way the, the chips are dominating uh, production. You know, Toyota has to reduce the number of cars that it produces, and Toyota and the automobile industry is the engine of growth for the Japanese economy. So uh, there are a lot of things that need to change and I think the change is in the, in the wind. So um, something to keep your eye on and I will be uh, continue to report about that. Let's shift gears a little bit about travel restrictions and COVID and what's going on with tourism. So you, you will remember that um, you know all tourism and in fact, just visiting um, uh, business people for trade shows or people who needed to rotate out, the CEO was being moved to Europe and then their new CEO was coming in. All of that was put on a hiatus, none of that happened. And then in uh, March, we began to see a little bit of change there. Not, no tourists yet, uh, but um, you know, 1,000 um, people a day coming in, then 2,000, 3,000. Uh, just this last month, it was uh, 20,000. And now it was announced uh, two days ago that that will jump up in July to 30,000. This is a pretty big deal. This is just for the um, uh, business people, uh, spouses, um, people who are related to uh, these individuals. It doesn't quite, um, there's, a, there's a small portion for tourists uh, in the batch for 20,000 right now and probably for the 30,000 for next month. <clears throat> they have a plan on reopening uh, tourism. And I know this is close to uh, your heart, uh, Maya, and to, to several people that are in the audience. Tourism is still going to be a little bit stymied. If you want to come to Japan on a tourist visa, there are only 98 countries that uh, qualify. That's pretty good. You know, 98 countries out of what, 130 countries in the world. So 98 countries have somewhat of a free pass in for tourists, but you can only come in as a part of a tour group. That tour group will be com coming into Japan and their schedules somewhat tightly monitored and the tour groups, the tour companies 
are obligated to um, apply uh, somewhat stringent guidelines. They'll be the government will be following that very closely to see is there any deleterious effect? Is is there any more incidents of COVID? Uh, how are these tourists acting when they come here? Um, it'll be a much stricter kind of uh, tourism. It's not like you can uh, come with the tour group and then uh, sneak away and go visit uh, Lopongi every night until the tour group uh, collects at Nadit Airport again. It's not going to be like that. And it's going to be probably a while since then, but I think probably in August, uh, which is not that far away. First, we need to get through the elections. We need to have July, the experience of July as a kind of a um, a test case. And then I think in August, things will, will um, uh, begin to fall together very quickly. You might remember that in 2019, my God, um, there was 31 million tourists that came to Japan in 2019. That is 86,000, if you divide it, 86,000 people a day. Um, so from 20,000 to 30,000, we're still not there. It's still not that robust. Probably the Chinese component of that, um, that block of tourists will not be there. And they had a, a large percentage. I don't know how large their percentage was, but um, if you uh, visited Kyoto in 2018 or 2019, you might've thought that they're all Chinese because they came in, in uh, really huge numbers. Um, so the, the more um, expected uh, level is probably uh, maybe 60,000 or 55,000 uh, per day. But we're, we're inching up to that and the government and business is telling the prime minister and the administration, we need more. We need it to be more open. Tourism is kind of a free ride for the economy. They get a great kick out of it. It doesn't really impose too many um, burdens on uh, the infrastructure. And um, people come in, they buy things, they leave their money, and then they, they get out of town. So it's, it's a part of the economy that is um, um, very vibrant. As you know from last week, uh, Japan was listed as the top tourist de destination of all countries. I listed the countries uh, last week. And um, Japan has always been uh, somewhat high. But even this year, after two, almost three years of no tourism, it's still ranking uh, the, the top place. So. Um, that's it with the uh, with the tourists, but the economy, um, as you you're following, you're noticing um, these price increases. It's like a somebody opened the gates and now it's a free for all. So um, initially, you saw uh, a couple of the beer companies saying we're going to increase the prices on on our beer, which is uh, gosh, you know, you come up to uh, the summer season and and the sales of beers just really takes off. You, you've got the beer garden thing going as well. So um, I think that kind of uh, opened the gap for other people to come in. And almost on a daily basis, you're finding other co other companies are announcing now. So um, in fact, JR has also announced that they're increasing um, the cost for the tickets. 7-Eleven said the cost of coffee is going to go up uh, 10 yen for the coffee. They're actually doing pretty well in uh, coffee sales. Um, have been for quite a while, giving Starbucks a real run for the money. Um, bathhouses, you know, I mean, uh, if you're Japanese, you are going to take a bath every day. And not every um, uh, house has, has the bath or shower, but also from a social and, and just a, um, uh, the perspective of, you know, being in the neighborhood, bathhouses are a pretty important component of any neighborhood. So their prices are going up too. So now you can see this is increasing all across the board. And um, with the sh uh, salaries not increasing, there is no plan for salaries to increase. The prime minister is in a pretty um, difficult spot because he wants to have this new capitalism. He wants to uh, share the, uh, the benefits of uh, a vibrant economy, but people are saving their money rather than spending it. And the amount of money that people have saved is far greater then, um, I mean, by far, um, the, the GDP of the country on an annual basis. Um, the prime minister has a couple of ideas of how to relinquish that or to give people opportunities or to reduce risk, to invest in capital ventures, to be more um, you know, aggressive in terms of 
uh, spreading out their diversifying their their holdings rather than having it in cash in in their pillowcase. So uh, this is a challenge for him, but I think he's he's uh, determined to do it. Somehow this money has got to come from from somewhere, and there's a lot of spending involved there. The Japanese, uh, you know, uh, GDP to debt ratio is by far uh, the largest in uh, in the G20, and he's got to do something about that rather than just you know printing money and having more stimulus packages. Uh, the economy has to take off. Thirty years it's been like this. Um, so he is really struggling with this. I think he's got the wherewithal to to create some some dynamism, um, but you know it is Japanese politics, so it really depends on uh, his relationship with other people in the party, with his coalition partner Komeito, and what happens in this next election. So in this next election, you'll you will pass through the next election, and guaranteed the prime minister will say, "Now I have a mandate. You voted for me because I said in some obscure." Um, speech that I'm going to do this. So since you voted for me overwhelmingly, I'm going to take this one. I'm going to run it uh, to the to the hill. So you're going to see a lot of that, a lot of new innovation, a lot of new things. It's going to be different from Suga. It's going to be vastly different from from Abe. There's still going to be some fights there, but there is change in the air. So be prepared for that and and watch it very closely. One of the other things before I, I wrap up is, uh, you know, one of the problems for the Japanese economy is. Our dependence on imported oil and energy products, LNG, gas, and oil in particular, um, it's not getting any better. And with the situation in Ukraine, you know, it's it's causing a lot of tensions. In fact, um, the Japanese government has insisted that uh, the sanctions apply to even the Sahalin One and Sahalin Two projects, where the uh, the the Russians are co-owners of these. Uh, development oil and gas uh, development projects and uh, the Japanese Mitsui company and and some of the Japanese corporations have said we're not going to get out of it I, I understand what the sanctions are I understand what we have to do we can't do that it's it's going to um, uh, put us in too too difficult of, of a situation so that's somewhat strange usually um, you know with um, administrative guidance the Japanese corporations especially the big corporations they're Pretty tightly bound to what the government says, and they um, they follow it pretty pretty carefully. So this is somewhat uh, surprising. So as a consequence of that, um, you know, the other alternative is uh, nuclear, and so they have um, many nuclear reactors that are on standby, not quite mothballed, but uh, since the Fukushima uh, disaster of of eleven years ago. Um, Many of them are still on standby. One of them has just received uh, approval to restart, and that's in Shimane. So that's a big deal. Um, it will start this time next year, probably April of next year. It needs to go through a little bit more of a vetting and uh, uh, a, a testing process. But I think with this one, even though the one in Hokkaido was um, by court order, uh, it's not going to start. The people in the community have uh, insisted that it doesn't restart. But I think the reality is that nuclear is, you know, one of the ways uh, to go forward. Um, and I think the Japanese government will um, be focused a lot more um, specifically on that. You can expect that to be coming up and being a news item in the next five or six months or within the, during these next five or six months, uh, the Japanese need to come to terms with, with the energy situation. And in consequence, of the relationship on Quad and the United States, I think you're just going to see a lot of real movement here, diplomatically, economically. The accounting standards, you know, Japan has its own kind of Galapagos uh, accounting standards. They're changing it so that it can be more um, internationally accepted and and more akin to actually what's going on in the United States. So, the influence of the United States and Japan is growing. You can see it um, inching its way forward, and I think it's uh, just. Uh, an acknowledgement of you know how how deep the the Japanese economy is just in the doldrums, and we've got to get out of that. Um, Thirty years is just way too much for amount of, the amount of money and the amount of energy that's been spent on recreating a, a vibrant economy that hasn't worked. So they've got to try something new. That's my report for today, Maya. I'd like to engender a discussion with people who have other ideas about these topics, or uh, maybe would like to initiate. Uh, topics that we haven't talked about. But thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in.
Maya, maybe turn on your mic. Thank you so there much. There we go. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay. So everybody on Clubhouse heard me once and they're going to hear me twice now. So thank you very much, Timothy, for preparing. And uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing you on the other side. Everybody's waiting for you there. We will continue the discussion. And oh, it's getting Looks cloudy. Like it's raining. Yes. Indeed. Oh, wow. Okay. So sorry. I hope that you don't melt down, uh, you know, in the rain. It so will please pass. It will pass. We'll, we'll have Clubhouse. We'll do Clubhouse for maybe uh, 50 minutes. The rain will pass. I'll hoist the sails and I'll be out in the, uh, in the wild <laughs> waters of Tokyo Bay. Great. Okay. See you on the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you there.